Um, well, um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Helen Kendrew, and uh, we're just about to start our live chat very shortly. We'll just give people time to maybe come in from the garden or finish cooking their tea or whatever. Um, marvellous. Okay. So, um, well, first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name's Helen Kenju, and I'm the clinic director here at uh, Care Bath and also the Care Bristol. And uh, today we're, we're doing this uh, particular chat from our Bath Clinic. And um, the clinic here has been established for well over 20 years, and uh, I've worked in the field um, as a nurse, actually, for more years than I care to think about, but over 20. And it's been a real privilege for me to help look after people as they are going through this quite intimate part of their lives in terms of trying to create the families that they hope for. So um, I found that uh, such a privilege, as I say. So we've been in quite unusual times of late. Um, I think when we heard about the COVID infection, it was happening somewhere across the other side of the world and probably like you, um, like SARS, I didn't really think this was going to affect us as such. But then gradually through March, uh, it became clear that um, this was going to have a big impact on us all collectively um, and also on those people going through fertility treatment. And let's hope it's a once in a lifetime event, but nonetheless, we were all um, quite shocked as I'm, I'm sure you were. And uh, the Department of Health with our licensing, our regulator, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which is quite a mouthful, so we'll call that the HFEA, the Department of Health were very clear that uh, in order to protect the NHS, then all non-urgent, non-emergency treatments just had to stop. And um, to be honest, that was really quite a shock. And um, we were shocked, staff were shocked, and many of our patients were very upset and concerned about what was going to happen. Um, you know, uh, we had to stop treatments um, and start to store embryos. And patients were calling us and concerned about whether that was going to impact on their chances of success, how long the clinic's going to be shut for, and um, would their embryos be safe, and what was going to happen to funding. And these were really difficult times. Our, our counselling service was very well used, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so now we're coming out of the pandemic, and. Uh, but as we know, in the background, things can change quite rapidly. But around the middle of May, the regulator indicated that fertility clinics could start to open. And we were very pleased to be able to give that information to patients and start to uh, put things into place. So what happens now in a fertility clinic in, these new, in this new situation? Well, you will know if you've been to visit us before, you will notice changes. Uh, we're asking everybody to wear facial coverings when they come to visit. We'll be contacting you in advance of any appointments you might have here to check that you are fit and well and um, just ensure that there's no risk of you bringing infection into the clinic. And uh, we'll be asking you to wait in your cars or outside the clinic and then one of the team will call you through for your appointment. <clears throat> and when you come into the clinic you'll notice pretty similarly to virtually every public place these days that we have a perspex screen and um, to protect our reception staff and all our nurses, doctors and embryologists will be wearing PPE and whatever is relevant for the particular treatment they're going to be doing. So masks or visors, gloves, aprons and so on. And um, we are delighted to see that so many of you have um, come today. I've got a lovely message from uh, our friend Karen. Thank you so much. That's so thoughtful. Our daughter, our granddaughter is seven years old now. Thank you for our miracle. That's so kind. Um, so for some people, 
this is all very new fertility treatment and um, it is it is to be honest quite a stressful thing to do but the team here in Bath and around the whole of the the care group want to make this as straightforward and as simple for you as possible um, if you're trying to have a baby you don't tend to broadcast to the nation about it and so actually having to step over the door to come into the clinic is really you know quite a significant thing to do uh, you may have spoken to our centralized patient advisory team the GEM team who may have booked your appointment for you here um, or you have spoken to some of our helpful patient advisors here in the center about your appointment and we're really pleased to have uh, a specific patient portal now so you can send lots of information and we can directly to you I'm, I'm told it's a bit like um, online banking the security of it so if you and your other half have a joint bank account as it were you have separate logins this would be similar for, for this and then you can access all the information and treat uh, about treatment and we can ask you to sign consent forms so hopefully we're minimizing as many visits to the clinic as you might need as possible and it's always been um, uh, the routine here in Bath that we want to minimize the visits to the clinic because we absolutely get that we're trying to fit this in with life the world and the universe and um, you know we, we want fertility treatment to fit in with you um, we're in this situation at the moment of being able to offer a blood a hormone blood test which you can do at home and semen analyses can be done at home and then dropped in here with, with an appointment we can't have everybody arriving at the same time with their analyses but you know all of this is hopefully going to make it slightly easier for yourselves um, the kind of treatments we offer here in Bath are pretty standard across the whole group so IVF, ICSI, donor insemination, egg donation, embryo donation, sperm donation and surrogacy and um, as I say, people are often quite anxious about how much time this is going to take up in their lives. So the first consultation that you have here will be with one of our specialist doctors who will review all your uh, results and just collate basically everything about you, having read all that in advance and get an idea of a, a diagnosis. We'll have the semen analysis results and if you need an ultrasound scan, we'll be able to do it for you on that day. And then generally we can set you off on um, a program of treatment and give you some pretty clear ideas of when it's going to suit you to come through for treatment. So I'm just looking at my wall planner here, but we've got wall planners in every room and everyone gets their apps out and their diaries and we work out in relation, in, in coordination with you really, uh, what, what is going to suit you best and when treatment might suit you. There are no waiting lists as such. It's pretty dependent upon when people's periods start and then you can you can begin treatment. Um, and then what we do is arrange for you to have medication delivered to your home. We use a home delivery service. It's very discreet. Uh, you can li you liaise directly uh, once we've ordered the medication for you with the company. And you can have it delivered to your home or your workplace or even your partner's workplace. And it, as I say, it's very discreet. It doesn't come with a bright yellow label screaming fertility drugs. It's, it's uh, very, um, very discreet. And um, in the past, the nursing team here would, or, and the doctors would generally have shown you how to give them the medication. But we've actually got lots of really good videos on the care websites, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, help you to understand how to give the injections. And I have to say the nursing team here are excellent at talking you through it if you get into a bit, a bit of a pickle. And people are quite anxious about injections. Are they going to make me feel dreadful? Will I be throwing plates and feeling very moody and that kind of thing? In, in the main, most people don't find it as bad as they might have anticipated. And um, at the end of the day, these are quite small injections. They're not sort of massive needles or anything horrible like that. It's, it's very uh, kind of as user friendly as this kind of thing can be. Um, and then when you've been taking a course of injections, we'll, there'll be one or two scans in the clinic where we'll be checking that you're either ready to start treatment or keeping an eye on how you're responding. And we can't actually see eggs on ultrasound scan, but what we can see are the little fluid filled sacs that have the eggs in them and when they reach a certain size it's telling the specialist nurses that you might be ready for egg collection. 
And then the egg collection is done here. And uh, in Bath, we use sedation uh, with uh, pain relief, which is a bit obvious. Um, generally, an egg collection can take takes around about 15 to 20 minutes. It's quite a speedy procedure. And for most women, the combination of medication we use is actually very, it makes the whole thing very manageable. And then the recovery rate post the procedure is actually quite quick. You can have a cup of tea or coffee and a sandwich in a bun and head off home. And um, then you'll be going home to really rest for the rest of that day. And if you're working, I would advise you to take the next day or two off as well. Um, and before you go home, our embryology team will be telling you how many eggs you've got and will arrange to ring you the next day to let you know how many eggs are fertilized. And from there, we'll be then planning when your embryo transfer can be booked in. And as I said at the beginning, your partner or a supporter can come with you now for your embryo transfer. And um, that procedure is fairly, sh is fairly quick. It's, you'd be here for about an hour, I would suggest. And then actually, the next bit is the really difficult bit because up to that point, you've been doing lots of really acute stuff and uh, we're telling you to do this and when you need to come for treatment. But the waiting until we do the pregnancy tests, which you actually will do at home, that, that really is the hard bit. And, and I really want to, to clarify that the nursing and counselling team and our patient advisors are so happy to have calls from people when they're in that waiting period, just so you don't feel that you are abandoned and <coughs> uh, just left uh, left your own devices. It can feel quite, quite a difficult period. Um, and then if you have a positive test, we will be doing a pregnancy scan for you here to confirm whether the pregnancy is uh, viable. And hopefully if everything goes according to plan, at that point you would then move back into antenatal care in, in the local area to your GP. Um, now I have a colleague here, you probably wonder what I keep looking at at my side, but um, you probably gathered I'm a little bit older and technology, Facebook, this kind of thing, I need a bit of support and I have a, a colleague here, Natalie, who's uh, helping me out and uh, sending me questions over the desk. So don't feel I've lost the plot somewhat if I keep staring down. And um, so I suppose what we might like to do now is have a little discussion about some of the extra things that care can do for you. I've mentioned our mm -hmm. counselling service, which is available on Skype and uh, Zoom, actually, and, um, and, and also by telephone. And also our doctors can do uh, follow-up consultations with you on the telephone, as can the nurses. And um, we're, we're very happy to be as supportive as possible in, in that direction. So we have asked the questions and um, I've got a number here. So forgive me if I keep looking down. Um, I have Saudi here called Clara who said, step by step what will I do to start treatment and how long can I t can it take hopefully I've given you a bit of an indication about the step by step through treatment um, uh, but essentially it will take around from the point of arriving for your consultation uh, we'll give you a plan as I mentioned and we would expect really that you could start treatment fairly imminently there are, there are no waiting lists as such but it's probably dependent upon your menstrual cycle and as I said before, maybe your social and work uh, commitments. But probably about five or six weeks from that consultation to getting into full treatment and getting out the other end and knowing that you have a positive test or not. Um, I've also had a question here from someone who's saying, I'd like to come in and chat with someone about my options before committing to a consultation. Can I do that? In the past, we've had um, 10 uh, uh, open evenings where we've booked appointments for you to pop in and have a chat with a specialist embryologist, specialist nurse or specialist doctor and uh, give you an indication of where you're going and the sorts of things you might need to consider. But at the moment, of course, we, we can't really do that. Hence the reason I'm 
speaking to you today, but you are very, very welcome to ring us and speak to one of the team and we'll give you as much information, helpful information, hopefully, as we can before you, you commit, as it were. Um, just have a look here. Um, somebody called Bex has been in touch to say, I have my first appointment in August. So, well, that's next week. So hopefully we'll see you soon. And another person has asked that as the clinics have been shut, uh, is there a long waiting list? I think it's fair to say that when the COVID situation first arose, we were taking in many courses, I say, from people who were in the middle of treatment or who were anxious about when treatment restart. And we kept a list and we've been steadily getting in touch with people. But I, I think uh, even though we are making sure that we are not having lots of people in the clinic at any one time, really, I don't think there, that, that this is having as much of an impact now as it may have done just after we reopened. And someone has also asked whether it's safe to start treatment during COVID-19. There's, there's quite helpful advice on the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists website. I'm sorry, that's such a mouthful. It's R-C-O-G. Very helpful advice because obviously people are trying to conceive without the help of an IVF clinic and everyone is asking similar questions. In the main, um, from a pregnancy point of view, the evidence seems to support at this moment that it, it isn't an issue, but it is still early days. And I guess in with regards to whether you want to have treatment when you're having during this particular period, it, it's really, uh, I guess, how you feel about whether you want to attend or whether you'd rather wait a little bit. And, and some people have chosen to wait a bit and see how the land lies before they decide to have treatment. Um, I have been asked if there is any difference between NHS funded and private or self-funded treatment. Um, I can honestly say no. Uh, we don't have different sets of notes, so I couldn't, wouldn't know from looking at someone's notes whether they were NHS treatment or, or self-funded. At the end of the day, I guess we would love it if the NHS could fund treatment for everyone, but we are in this world where there are specific criteria and if you're lucky enough to fit them and can come here, then um, really very, very little difference in the treatment. No difference, I don't mean very little. Uh, I've also got an anonymous question here from someone who said, um, in my last IVF cycle, I needed the support of going into the clinic and speaking with the team when I had a problem. I'm worried there won't be the same support during COVID since we've been going in, we'd be going into the clinic less. So I suppose what I would say to you there is that actually an awful lot of support, even before COVID was over the telephone. And uh, we honestly would be very happy to hear from you. And we do understand that people are feeling anxious and we want to make you feel as supported as possible. And if you really were feeling you needed to come in, well, well, obviously you could, because sometimes it is useful to sit opposite someone and catch up with, uh, you know, to talk, to, to, to talk about the specific question that you have. My next question is about weight. Um, is there a weight limit? Um, so I think we're all being told at the moment by the government, aren't we, to consider our weight, get on our bicycles and think about our BMI. There, that might be an issue in terms of NHS funding in that you sometimes have to reach certain criteria of weight. Um, around about 29 to 30 is an upper edge. We do have a bit of flexibility for people who don't reach criteria. It can go as um, around about 35. We, if any more than that, we'd be starting to get a little bit anxious. And the point is that whilst you might be overweight that can have an impact on how the fertility drugs might how you might respond to the fertility drugs and also we do want you to feel that if you're going into pregnancy that you a fit weight and um because obviously you put on weight during pregnancy if you started overweight and you put more weight on during pregnancy there is an obstetric risk and what we're here to do is to try and create live and healthy babies um, 
sometimes people can be too thin and they stop ovulating. Um, very sporty people might find this is a bit of an issue. Um, so we do sometimes have to tell people to actually eat a bit more, which is also quite interesting. Um, my next question is someone who's got quite a specific question about her partner's sperm. Um, they're waiting, they've got the funding and waiting to proceed to IVF with ICSI. And my husband has reduced normal forms with his sperm. Is there anything we can do? We are currently eating well and have stopped alcohol. Um, in the main, it sounds to me like you're doing, doing the right thing. We talked about uh, an appropriate weight earlier on. Um, there are some supplements that you can take uh, which might help give you certain vitamins. Zinc seems to be a, a particularly uh, uh, hot topic at the moment, but it's really important that you follow the instructions on the packet because if you think, gosh, if I take a few more, it might boost things, actually it can do as much harm. So there are supplements, as I say, um, we do sell some here in the center, but do read the package and make sure that you are not uh, over indulging in vitamins and supplements. Um, if you have embryos already frozen and would like to try again, how much will we be looking at? So in terms of cost, we're looking at around about 1600 pounds. I'm just gonna check the price list to be absolutely sure because things do change quite quickly. Excuse me. So um, in a natural cycle, we're looking at um, around about 1,100 pounds. And in a medicated cycle, it's going to be a bit more than that, around about 1,600 pounds. And, and there would be some medication to take in a, a medicated cycle. Sometimes you can do a natural cycle if you're someone who ovulates reliably and we can plan to replace the embryos to around about the time that of ovulation or shortly after. But if you are someone who doesn't ovulate reliably, you'll need to have the medicated cycle. Um, another person has been in touch with us who has something, an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's. This is actually uh, a disorder of the thyroid. And we do check thyroid levels actually as people are um, before they start treatment. And uh, generally this would be well managed and fairly straightforward and would not have an impact on your IVF treatment. Um, and when do you think the HFEA will allow immune suppressing suppressing treatment to start? Um, I don't I don't know that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Rather, they are still considering where we're going with this, and we're beginning to move towards it. But um, the HFEA were very specific about. Uh, when we started treatments in clinics to make sure that we were taking care of people and not putting them at risk. And if we were to suppress um, your immune system, then that might be a bit of an issue if you were potentially at risk of COVID. So I think we're beginning to look at it and we're taking steps towards that. Um, do you recommend isolating at all during treatment? I imagine this question is related to in the COVID situation. Um, and I think, again, that's a fairly personal choice. We're all beginning to get out a little bit more, but it is a bit strange, isn't it, to, to get back into normal life. As I said at the beginning, I would suggest that you um, take a day or two off after egg collection, but in terms of the whole treatment, I think you've got to take your own personal decision about that and comply with all the, the rules. Someone has asked me here, how does the hydrosalpinx affect infertility <coughs> or fertility treatment? And for those of you that don't know, uh, hydrosalpinx is um, where we have a collection of fluid in the fallopian tube. And the tube can act, the fluid can actually drip into the uterus and maybe have an impact on uh, implantation of embryos. So your con consultant will talk to you about how whether this should be dealt with before IVF treatment um, and sometimes there can be a procedure to to clip the tube so this fluid doesn't actually come into the uterus. Right. 
and if you just excuse me a minute, I'm just going to look over for some more comments. Um, it's on my left hand side. So I've just had um, a lovely comment from another Helen, good name, just putting one of your babies to bed now. The other is playing Lego with daddy next door. You are all truly amazing. Oh, thank you so much. That's such, um, so lovely to hear. I hope all is going well with you, Helen. That's great. Um, and then I have someone here saying, I have my fertility assessment at Care Bath at the end of August. What are the next steps after that appointment? And how long will, uh, is the wait? So hopefully I covered that. I hope you got in and heard that a little bit earlier, but from the appointment, probably about five or six weeks to getting into treatment and, and so on. And this person's also an NHS patient. If you've got funding, it's fine. There's no difference on the waiting list. And um, we've talked about weight. What type of tests would I need to have before starting treatment? The uh, we do some basic hormone tests for the woman. Uh, we're looking at ovarian reserve, which helps us give an indication of maybe how much medication that we might use. And um, also a semen analysis for the partner. You'd have an ultrasound scan as well, so we can check your ovaries and um, one or two te other tests around thyroid, as I mentioned, and also a hormone called prolactin which is the hormone of stress. Probably I'm feeling a bit of that at the moment whilst I'm talking to you live. Uh, but prolactin um, is a hormone that's produced uh, and suppresses ovulation because it's the hormone used, which we produce when uh, women are breastfeeding. So we check that out. And, um, and then uh, we would, once you get to start treatment, there's a number of uh, a routine screen, we would screen for hepatitis B, HIV and hepatitis C because we need to have uh, negative tests there so we can store your embryos uh, safely. Do you have a certain weight? I think we covered that. Someone's saying it's reassuring to see all the positive reviews, that's good. Um, in terms of um, getting to the clinic here, one of the things you might like to think about when you're considering a treatment is, A, how do the team feel? Are they, are they nice? Or are they gonna look after us properly? Um, can I nip out in my lunch hour or leave work and that sort of thing? And um, we have really good parking here in Bath that's, um, and in Bristol. You don't have to pay for parking. You can park easily come in and then head off home and we do uh, there is a local bus service as well because we are just a little bit outside bath uh, but the parking is really good we do use ultrasounded guidance for insemination of, for IVF um, actually what we do is measure the cavity of the uterus and then we place the embryo at uh, the right point for you so we're tailoring treatment sorry they're coming coming through thick and fast here uh, we have already had children have been trying for four years where do we start with IVF and who do we contact right you just ring us uh, if you start off by ringing our GEM team which is on the care website that's um, our uh, patient advisors who can work out where you live and when you um, can come and we'll get you an appointment with our doctors here um, but we probably need to get on and see you fairly promptly. So if you ring the GEM number or the main clinic number here, we'd be happy to help you. Um, then someone has uh, talked to me here about their sperm count, been taking, it sounds like a supplement for four months. It, um, should they be retested? We would always retest, thank you. Um, we would always retest, um, you, you never, do treatment on the basis of one result. So there would definitely be a retest for you. Someone else asking about exercise. I start IVF in a few weeks. I exercise six days a week. What guidance do you give for exercise? Well, at the end of the day, we don't want to end up being couch potatoes, uh, but I equally don't want you to suddenly have a change of um, exercise regime and start an Iron Man, for example. So whatever you're doing at the moment is probably okay. But as we get through treatment, you might just begin to find that uh, you're feeling a little bit heavy um, as the fertility injections start to have an impact. 
and probably won't want to do quite as much uh, hefty exercise. So a good brisk walk, as my grandma would say, is uh, the best, best thing to do. But for the moment, keep fit. Um, are we coming to the end? Um, okay. One or two more on screen and that will Okay, right. So someone has asked here, do we do natural killer cell testing or endometrial receptivity testing ooh, for, for recurrent miscarriage? Um, there's, uh, the jury is a little bit out on all of this. Um, there's certainly um, something called endometrial scratching, which has been shown not, not to be effective. Uh, but there are other tests we can do for recurrent miscarriage. And I really advise you to speak to one of our specialist consultants. All the consultants working here are also obstetricians and gynecologists. So they're really well versed in giving you information about that. And... Um, okay. I just go to the bottom. Um, a single woman wanting to know if there is some financial support for NHS funding. Um, there may be, if you have an actual cause of infertility, such as block tubes or so on, then there, there may be some NHS funding for you. Someone else is telling me their prolactin is a little bit high. What can I do with that? Well, we'll check it again. And if it's still high, you can take some medication which will reduce your prolactin levels. All the cycles have had been at a different clinic. So now thinking of coming to you based on positive reviews. Well, thank you very much, Rosie. That's marvellous. Uh, do you have to be referred from a consultant for IVF? <clears throat> you can have a consultation here, self-referring. And I think that, I think that we probably answered everything. I'm just going to check with my colleague to make sure I haven't left anyone out who's going to feel a bit offended because I appreciate we're coming up to the end. Okay, so thank you for that. So um, for private IVF, I had a question. We have a number of options actually um, because we do have some <coughs> funding packages available. I'm so sorry. <coughs> Uh, but a, a standard IVF cycle would be around about £3,200 and a drug sure. package would be from about eight to, to £1,200 depending upon uh, what sort of medication you need to be prescribed. But we will give you a costed treatment plan so you know exactly what you're in for and uh, hopefully that is fairly helpful. And... Okay, so nervous about success rates is turning 42 next week. Any advice? Uh, crack on um, and have treatment. What we do know, and I'm sorry because you'll have heard this so many times and want to shout at me, but what we do know is fertility treatment and IVF success rates do tend to, to go into lower figures once we've gone over 40. It's really unfair when we all feel so fit and young at heart and what have you. But we're probably looking around, around a success rate of around about 23%. I'm just looking at our up-to-date figures. Uh, but Louise, if you want to give us a call, um, please do that. Okay. So thank you so much for watching. If we haven't asked any of your questions, um, and I'm sorry, I do read quite quickly, but there are quite a few coming in then we will message you tomorrow and give you some helpful information. I do hope you found today interesting. I think me, my colleague and I found it uh, quite hot and interesting here as well. Thank you so much for, for, for joining the event. We're really very grateful uh, on this lovely hot evening. And I do hope you found today's question and answer session helpful. And if there's any more information we can give, just please get in touch and uh, have a lovely evening.